Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to worship as we gather, as we began this morning in God's house, finishing the Lord's day together as his people. Today we are reminded that though we are a small people, maybe even a small crowd, we serve a God who is very big, and that will be the theme of this service. And as we come into the presence of that big God, all of us, let's bring our lives in prayer. Would you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here. That before the earliest of us walked in this doors, uh, the church this evening, even before we walked in the doors this morning, that already you were here waiting to welcome us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would move through this place again tonight, that you would stir in our hearts a desire to know you and an ability to trust you and strength to obey you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for each person here and those listening by radio or television or internet. We thank you that together by your grace we are one body, one group of little people under a big God in your world. Father, we thank you for these things and these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you stand for our call to worship? And this evening, that great big God speaks to us from Psalm 146. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves righteousness. We see the reversals of this morning. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. The psalmist sees the reversal of God's kingdom and at the end professes that the Lord reigns. And we come here tonight with that same profession, our big God reigns. Let's sing about that together. Psalter hymn number 465. Sing praise to God who reigns above. We'll sing stanzas one and two and five. that great big God that we praise and give glory, he is the one who comes and knows each of us by name and greets us with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit with each of you 
now and forevermore. Amen. As God's people gathered in his presence, would you please turn this evening and greet those around you. If you're a visitor with us, a guest, welcome also to Bethel. Friends, you may be seated. Our call to worship were some of the words of that great creation, Psalm 146. Now we will hear a psalm, two psalms later, Psalm 148, which speaks again of the greatness of our God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. He set them in place forever and ever. He gave a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. He has raised up for his people a horn, the praise of all his saints, of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. With all creation, we bring our praise to God, and we can do that because we see his greatness by faith. Our next song invites us to sing those words by faith. We'll sing stanzas one through three and five.
as children of the promise, I'd like to actually invite our boys and girls up for a children's message. If there's any children here, even if you're a guest with us, you're welcome to come up for our children's message. The sad children who didn't get to go boating today. But we're thankful that you're here. Come on up. Well, kids, you've been on summer vacation for a, a while now, so I'm guessing that maybe you're forgetting some of your schooling. How many of you are forgetting everything you learned in school? Anyone else? Yeah. When you graduate, you can do that the rest of your life. It's really quite good. Um, I want to see if if you guys still remember how to count, how many people will still remember how to count? Most of you, you know, you just know your numbers? What I like to do is I've got cards here, and I just want to, I'm just going to hand some out. I just want you to, however many I hand you, just count how many you've got, okay? Can you count? One, count a couple. Who else can count? Yeah. Just, grab, just, just, just tell me how many you've got. We just want to see how, how good you're, there's some there. Just count how many you've got. We'll just give a couple people, and I'm just going to see how many you've got. Okay, yeah, let's just, and, and maybe you guys, here you can, I'll give you the rest of the, how many know how many cards are in a whole deck? Anyone know? Your parents didn't teach, yeah? 52, that's right, Alan, very good, yeah, that's very good. Um, here, you can take a couple too. So just, just, I'll ask you now, how many cards do you have? Just see how you're doing for counting. How many cards do you have? You've got three? Okay, very good. How many did you have? Six, okay. How many? Two? Three. Oh, that's, uh oh. You guys are very good at counting, actually. Three. Yeah, I, I must have not given very many. How many did you have? Nine. Yeah, you had a nine. You had just one card, you had a nine. How many did you have? Four. Four, okay. Four. Two. How many? Two. Two and three. Okay, so you guys are pretty good at counting for small numbers. That was actually just warm up. Now I want to see something else. Okay, do you want to volunteer? Okay, we're going to count how many hairs we have on, on our head here. So let's just, Grace, can you help? How many hairs do you think she has? Let's, let's count, okay? Can I, can I help? You want to help? Kind of gather around here. We need to do this together. Okay, so here's, here's hair number one. You want, to, you want to hold that, hair number one? Don't pull it. Okay, so, okay now you want to hold number, hair number two? You've got to help me out. This is going to take a long time. We've got, how many hairs do you think we have on here? You have to estimate, you, have to estimate, you think, because there's a soccer game on tonight, isn't there? Yes. How long do you think it would count us to count the number of hairs on one person's head? How long do you think that would take? Maybe a whole day, yeah. Could you imagine counting the hairs of everyone in the congregation, counting every one of their heads? Can you imagine how long that would take? Except for your grandpa, right? Because that won't take long at all. But <laughs> we're going to learn about today that God also counts. And actually, every person here, including every one of you, God knows exactly how many hairs are on your head because he loves you that much and he knows you that well that he knows every one of us. He said, how many hairs do I have? He can give you the number. And if your brother pulls one out, he even knows that. That's how much God loves you. And I want you to think about that today. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about God's providence, okay? So remember, God knows you and he knows how many hairs you have. And as you do that, you can each grab a piece of candy and then go back to your seat. And as they do, I'd like to invite each of us to turn in God's Word. We're in the New Testament, the book of Matthew chapter 10. And then we're also going to be in our Grace Altar hymnals, looking at the contemporary testimony, Our World Belongs to God. We're in paragraph 13 today. Um, both the text and the World Belongs to God paragraph will be on the screen. But if you want to go in the Psalter hymnal, that's page 870, 871. And in our Pew Bibles, that is on page 902. 902, Matthew chapter 10. As a reminder, we've been walking through this contemporary testimony, Our Will Belongs to God, which is divided into four sections following redemptive history, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. Today we finish the first of those four sections. This is the final paragraph on creation, and the next time we're going to begin that second section on the fall, how the world went wrong. But today we're finishing up what it means that God made this world. And so that's where we're going to be studying today. 
And we're going to be looking at specifically the doctrine of providence. Now, if you're a member at Bethel for a while, you'll know that we've studied that doctrine in story form a number of times. We spent a whole uh, series on the life of the book of, of Joseph in Genesis. And we saw that the story of Joseph is really a story of how God's providence bends a very broken family and he uses it to save that family and the nation around. We also did a whole series on the book of Esther, a book that has no mention of God whatsoever, and yet we saw that's a story really of God without his name being mentioned, working in this world his will. And we also did a series in the book of Ruth, which is a book with no miracles, and yet we saw God also providentially working in the lives of those characters. And so we've seen providence in action. Tonight we're going to study providence. What is it? And as we prepare to do that, I want you to read with me, first of all, the teaching of paragraph 13. And so let's read these words together, saying, God directs and bends to his will all that happens in this world. As history unfolds in ways we only know in part, all things from crops to grades, from jobs to laws, are under his control. God is present in our world by his word and spirit. The faithfulness of our great provider gives sense to our days and hope to our years. The future is secure for our world belongs to God. And with that teaching about providence, we go to Jesus speaking. And before we do, we're going to pray for him to speak to us. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, you are truly big. Your presence would dwarf this universe. Your mind would confuse even the most brilliant of us. And yet we pray that small people though we are, that tonight by your word and spirit, you would speak in ways that we could understand. Lord, that as we grapple with the mystery of your providence, that you would give us not confusion or pride, but the deep humility of those who know their Savior and trust in him. Father, we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 10, we're going to read verse 28 through 31. So Jesus is speaking and he says, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, tonight I want to introduce us to a family. I have a picture of the family here. The father's name is Josh. His wife's name is Vanessa. And their little boy is Hudson. Josh and Vanessa grew up in the Seattle area and went to different churches, but they met at a church event and shared a deep love for Jesus Christ and a passion to make him known. And so they found in that love for God, a love for one another, and they got married. Went into ministry and actually youth ministers at another church in the Seattle area, and their passion is to show young people who Jesus is. In the course of their marriage, God has blessed them with a, a little baby, now eighth month, eight uh, months old, Hudson. This is the happy family. Those who know this family say it is a family marked by deep joy. Even little Hudson, there's videos of him laughing and giggling for hours on end. This is the Ellis family. Now you've met them. I want to tell a story about what happened on uh, Monday, just a little bit after Easter, actually a week after Easter this spring. So April 13, a Monday morning, was their day off from ministry. And so they were going to relax and they were going to actually a, a, a place where they could do some singing because they love to sing. And so at about 1040 in the morning, they were on Highway 410, a state highway, going through uh, a, a suburb of western Seattle. As they were driving along there, things were going well, but there's something about this route I want to tell you about. Highway 410 goes under an overpass of a, a, another road named Angelina Road. And that overpass on Angelina Road was under construction on that Monday morning. That construction involved a concrete barrier which was fixed there firmly, but unbeknownst to anyone, that concrete barrier was actually working its way loose in the construction zone. 
But don't worry, that construction zone, you know, is just, a, you know, that's on a, a bridge, which is about 4.9 meters tall. The way that gravity works, 9.8 meters per second, means that if it would fall, it would only fall for half a second. That's as long as it would take to go from the bridge to hit the ground safely. Only half a second, that's the only danger area. And this young family, they're driving along at 60 miles an hour. That means they're covering 88 feet per second. And that concrete barrier is only three feet wide. And so if in one second, one 1,000, you go 88 feet, the chance of being under a three-foot section is very, very small, especially if it's only in the air for half a second. These young people in their 20s and their son should have been in a, even a normal world absolutely safe, except for they weren't. Because as their pickup truck passed under Angelina Road on Highway 410 at 4, 1045 in the morning on April 13, that barrier gave way at that exact moment. And in fact, it gave way in such a way that it didn't even break their windshield. It fell right behind their windshield on their roof, killing all three of them instantly. And I want us to think about that today, this young ministry couple filled with joy, serving God. When we say as we talk about providence that God is in control, what do we mean? And what do we do with that? If we say that God is in control and we look at this family, does that bring us comfort? Does it bring us comfort that God is in control and that means that this tragedy is part of a bigger story that we don't see the end of, that this was not an accident, this was not a surprise to God, this was his plan, this was their time? Does that bring us comfort? Or does the fact that God is in control and precisely timed the falling of that beam exactly when that car with that young family would be right under it, does that bring us terror, not comfort? How do we respond to the doctrine of God's providence? Comfort or terror? Matthew chapter 10 is an interesting text because both of those emotions are here. This chapter, the section we have, begins with that command, that injunction, be afraid, have some terror, in verse 28. And then in verse 31, it says, don't be afraid. And in between those two things, there is an explanation of God's providence. That somehow in Jesus' mind, providence is connected both to comfort and to terror. And the question is, how does providence invoke both emotions, terror and comfort, at the same time? Be afraid, don't be afraid. Providence. How? Well, if we study this text, we'll see that in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus is commissioning his disciples. So in very first verse, verse 1 of chapter 10, Jesus calls the 12 disciples. He gives them authority to drive out spirits, to cure diseases. And then in verse 5, Jesus sends the 12 out. And they're going to a very hostile world. A Roman world that thinks what they're talking about is foolishness and a Jewish world that thinks what they're talking about is blasphemy. And so the world is arrayed against them. There's a lot of anxiety in the hearts of these disciples. And so twice, Jesus will give them a word of comfort. In verse 26 is the first of those. He says, so do not be afraid of them. And then in verse 28, he says, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body. In both those ways, he's saying, you're going to bring my gospel to a hostile world, but don't be afraid of other human beings because humans are weak and their power is limited. Double word of comfort. But then Jesus gives a word of warning. After saying twice, don't be afraid, then Jesus commands, rather be afraid of the one who can destroy body and soul in hell. Don't be afraid of people. They're weak. Their power is limited. But be afraid of God. He is strong and his power is unlimited. Comfort and terror. And then Jesus gives two examples of how strong and unlimited is God's power. And both of these examples speak of providence. The first is this example of the birds. He says, two sparrows are sold for a penny. The word there for penny is a specific coin which was worth one-sixteenth of a drachma. Drachma is a daily wage, which means that each sparrow is worth one-thirty-second of a daily wage of a poor laborer. Nothing. He says, look, those little birds that are nothing, God so is in control that they can't even die without his permission. And then he goes on more personally. He says, in the very hair's of your head are numbered. Sparrows are the least important animal, and yet God controls for them. Your hair is your least important bodily part, and yet God numbers it. And so his point here in Matthew 10 is Jesus is saying, 
God is control of the biggest things there are, heaven and hell, and the smallest things there are, sparrows and hare. He is controlling both your internal destiny and your life details. God is in control of all of it. And that's the doctrine of providence. That's what our will belongs to God is pointing us to. God directs and bends to his will all that happens in this world. As history unfolds in ways we only know in part, all things, from crops to grades, from jobs to laws, from concrete pillars falling on pickup trucks, are under his control. All things. That's providence. So you wrestle with that tonight. What I'd like us to do is to break it apart and really try to answer three questions. First of all, what is providence? Second of all, what are the three elements of providence? And maybe that's something you can learn tonight. And then lastly, how should, what should our response be? How should we walk away from understanding what it is and what these three elements are? What should be our response? Fear or comfort? Those are the three questions. So first of all, what is providence? Well, the word for providence actually doesn't occur in Scripture. There is a Greek word, uh, pronoia, which means literally to foresee or foresight. But if you look in the Hebrew Bible, that actually only occurs in relation to human beings. There are four examples in the New Testament where human beings have some foresight, but it's never per, uh, described about God. So in all the Bible, you're never going to see God described, or you're never, never going to see the word providence connected to God. So we say, well, is this really a biblical doctrine? Well, actually it is, and the image I want to give you is think about a quilt. Even if a quilt isn't inscribed or, or, or embroidered with the word thread, that doesn't mean the quilt doesn't have thread. Even though the Bible doesn't contain the word providence, it doesn't mean it doesn't contain the idea of providence because just as thread is what makes up the quilt, so providence is the thread that makes up the tapestry of Scripture. You could say providence is the ink that wets the pen of redemptive history. It is all the way through Scripture. And I say that because arguably the central point of Scripture would be this phrase, that God is king. From the very beginning when God says, let there be light, to the very end when the nations are gathered around his throne, the story of Scripture is that God is king. Another word for that is that God is the sovereign. And providence is simply God's sovereignty in action. That's all that it means when we talk about providence. And if you think that's coming from theology, it's not. It's coming from straight scripture. So, for example, in Psalm 103, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 135, the Lord does whatever pleases him in heavens and on the earth, in the seas and in all their depths. God reigns. Uh, in Daniel 4, all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of earth. No one can hold back his hand and say to him, what have you done? Ephesians 1, in him we also were chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. God is king, he is sovereign, and providence simply means that his sovereignty rules everything. That's what we mean by this doctrine. That's what we mean by it. Then a definition would be simply that providence is God's loving control over all things. That God is in control. And if you want a more theological definition, then Louis Burkhoff gives this one. Providence is that work of God by which he preserves all his creatures, is active in all that transpires in the world, and directs all things to their appointed end. That's what providence is. Those three things. He preserves his creatures, he's active in all that happens, and he directs things to his end. And that's what the, brings us to the second question. If that's what providence is, what are those three elements? And I want to briefly unpack those three tonight. Because I think as we do, we're going to see some interesting things and also some deep questions to leave with. So that first part of providence, that God... Um, preserves all his creatures. What do we mean by that? Well, we're in the part of the will belongs to God which deals with creation. But Christians believe not that only God created this world and then stepped back and kind of just observed what he made as it continued to function without him touching it. We believe that after God created, God continues to work. And we call that act of continuing to create, not creation, but providence. Providence is another way of saying ongoing creation. 
And we get this understanding that God is working in the creation even today, even at this moment, because that's what Scripture says again and again. So, for example, in Nehemiah chapter 9, we read this. You alone are Lord, then speaking of creation, you past tense made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. That's Genesis 1 and 2. And then present tense, you give life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. The idea here is that God created, but that there's ongoing creation. He did something, but he also sustains what he did. We see that, for example, our way in the New Testament, Acts 17. For in him we, present tense, live and move and have our being. Colossians 1. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hebrews 1. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The idea here is that creation is dependent on God, and God is independent of creation. That we shouldn't think about our lives or our world or the, world, the nature around us as something that's just going on like a watch that God wound up and now is not controlling. It is something that he is actively sustaining. That if he would take his hand away for a moment, everything would cease to exist. We are dependent on God. That creates humility. But it also creates wonder. How many of us see the, the fireflies at night and even ever go outside and just see the fireflies? What this means is those things are not flying around apart from the creator who made them, you know, millions, billions of years ago, this process that he started, now he's sitting back. That the path of each firefly in your backyard tonight, you see in that the finger of the God who sustains that little bug. That the breath that you will take in this next moment comes as not something that you do apart from God, but that is God sustaining, holding together this creation and you and me as part of it. It's a wonderful dimension of God's providence that God is that involved in our lives. Amen? That's the first part. But then there moves to the second part. God somehow sustains, preserves this all, but then Reformed theologians say something else, and the second part is where we trip up, and this is where all our problems are. Not only does he sustain this world, but he is active in this word, all that transpires. The first is his preservation. This is his, we call, concurrence or his cooperation. If you wonder what this means, Louis Burkhoff defines it this way. God is operative in every act of his creatures, not only in their good, but also in their evil acts. Now read that again. God is active in every act of his creatures, not only in their good, but also in their evil acts. God stimulates them to action, accompanies their action at every moment, and makes this action effective. Is anyone disturbed by that? Anyone? Hitler. Just think about Hitler and read that paragraph. Think about the man who holds the knife, who attacks a family, and is persecuting them, a Boko Haram terrorist, that God is involved in every action, every moment, every movement. Is God involved in that terrorist hand? That's what we're saying here. That that's God's providence. Not only sustaining life and our breath and fireflies, those plight things, but also moving through even the darkness. How can we say that? Well, because Scripture speaks in this way, this all-encompassing way in which God is involved. So we see in Scripture, God is involved down to the details and even the dark details of creation. We read that already tonight, Matthew chapter 10. He's involved in the small things. Even when a sparrow dies, whether from a plague or avian flu or the BB of a, of a shot of a stray bullet from a 14-year-old kid, in every instance, when the sparrow falls, it is according to the will of the Father. The flight of that BB the mutation of that virus, God's involved, says Scripture. And not just in the small things, even in the apparently random things. Proverbs 16, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. Even that apparently arbitrary cracking of concrete falling from an overpass onto Highway 410, God's involved. He's involved in our good deeds. For example, in Philippians 2, Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. The good we do is God working in us. But it's not just the good. It's also the bad. And so we go back to that story of Joseph. And what do we read in Genesis chapter 45? 
Joseph says, and now do not be distressed, brothers, or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here, for God sent me here before you to preserve life. That in that action, when the brothers of Joseph took their little brother and set him off to slavery and lied to his father, all of this blackness of human evil, in that moment, they sent him, they sold him, but God sent him. God was involved in the midst of their evil. Same thing in the New Testament, Acts chapter 4. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do what your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. That in that moment, that the Pharisees and the crowd shouted, crucify him, crucify him. It was the sound of the Father God in them speaking the words to accomplish his plan. What do we do with that? Well, the second portion of this doctrine creates two problems for us. And I'm not going to solve them tonight because there is a soccer game, but I do want to at least note them. The first problem this creates is the problem of free will. If God is really the one who moves in us, who stimulates us to action, who accompanies the action, and who makes sure that it is effective, if God is involved in all that we do in every moment, then how can we say we are involved? He's pretty big. We're pretty small. How can we be involved if God is? What Reformed theologians say is it's not either or, it's both and. Burkhoff says this, the same deed is in its entirety both a deed of God and a deed of the creature. That it's not half God and half us, or only God and none of us, or only us and none of God. That the way God's providence works in this world, it's kind of like a father with his finger on the mouse, on his, the finger of his daughter on the mouse at their computer, and they see a Barbie video and they both click at the same time. Everyone clicks at Barbie videos, right? Anyone have any little girls, right? Click. It's not just the daughter who clicked, the father did, but he didn't force her finger. It was a cooperation. That's why this is called concurrence. That evil people act out of their evil desires. God acts out of his good plan for for creation. That together they do the same action. God not being the author of evil, the human being the author of evil and therefore guilty of it, and yet working together, God for a good purpose, even though they're working for a bad purpose. They're selling their brother to slavery. He is sending him to deliverance. That's how we understand this. And that brings us to the second issue, not just free will, but the problem of evil. How can we say that God is responsible for the hands that swipe the blade and murder? How can we say that God is responsible for the concrete that crushes an eight-month-old little boy? There is no easy answer to that. But maybe part of the answer is that providence is what happens in those silent moments when God doesn't seem to be there. Miracles are the flashy presence of God when someone is sick and God's hand reaches down in ways that everyone can see and takes that tumor and rips it out of the body and someone's healed. That's the God that we see. But providence is the God who is present in those moments when God seems most absent. When the silence of God and the reality of suffering screams in our souls that there is no God, that's when the doctrine of providence holds out hope that God is at work. And in fact, the creator who works in creation did that most specifically when the creator became part of creation in Jesus Christ. And as we suffer, that creator in the creation suffered with us. And he did so so that suffering would not have the last word. That God's providence shows that suffering has an end and there will be redemption and new beginning and the tears will be wiped away. I can't solve the problem of evil tonight, but providence is not the problem It is part of God's solution for that tension we feel. That brings us to the third point. So God sustains, preserves this world. God is active in all that happens. And then thirdly, we read in that definition that God directs all things to their appointed end. And that's what I'm talking about. That this world is heading in the direction God has set for it. That all those little things and all those big things, those things we don't understand, Those are moving to a day that God does understand. All those verses I read about his sovereignty, that's what this is speaking about. But just to show you how real that is in our lives, that sovereignty extends to the world around us and to our lives. So for example, in Job chapter 12, 
God makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and leads them away. The vote in Greece today, that was God's direction. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Even little Hudson, that eight-month-old baby, his days were written in God's book. Moving on. In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. Proverbs 21. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He directs it like a water course wherever he pleases. Moving on. God changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and sets up kings. Acts 17. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And God determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God is sovereign. Not only sustaining this world, not only moving along with this world, but directing this world. Nations and kingdoms and empires and uncles and aunts and you and me. Every moment of our days, directing it towards his purpose. That's providence. Which brings us to the final point. What are we to do? How are we to respond to this? Well, providence today, I hope you've seen, is grounded in two attributes of God. First of all, it's grounded in the fact that God is sovereign. And providence, I defined as sovereignty in action. That's part of providence. Providence is also grounded in the fact that God is creator. That it is the ongoing creation. We've seen that. But there's a third attribute of God that providence is grounded in. Not just that God is king and sovereign, not just that he is creator and sustainer, but he is also father. Providence is God's love in action. Providence is God's love in action. And that's what we see in Matthew chapter 10 when Jesus is comforting his disciples. Notice what he talks about God as. Yet not one of them will fall to the ground Apart from the will, not of the Almighty God, not of the Creator God, not of the Sovereign of the universe, but apart from the will of your Father. And even the hairs of your head are numbered by that Father. So don't be afraid. That's where providence ultimately ends. Not the power of the Creator or the might of the Sovereign, but the love of the Father. And that all this broken world with the falling of concrete and the working of murderers and the things we do not understand and our questions and our tears, that the one who is on the steering wheel of history is our Father who loves us. Which is why we can say with Romans 8, 28, that we know that in all things God, this Father, works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That's where providence takes us. That's why when the confessions reflect on providence, they find in it not terror, but comfort. Heidelberg Catechism answers the question this way. How does the knowledge of God's providence, creation providence, help us? How should we respond? And the answer is we can be patient when things go against us, thankful when things go well, and for the future we have good confidence in our faithful God and Father that nothing in creation will separate us from his love. Creation is God's love in action. It is God the Father moving us in love. And so he took the life of that little family, the Ellis family. And yet as cameras surrounded the grieving families of the father and the mother, and they interviewed them, they were angry. And angry not at OSHA or at the workers, A kind of anger that is in a broken world diffuse. They don't know who to be angry about. But someone they love is now gone and they are hurting. And yet God had through engagement with Scripture so envisioned these people's understanding of the world that they knew that even in this, God is sovereign. That even in this, the Creator who sustains this world and the galaxies and their courses also would sustain them. And that even though they don't understand, their Father would bring this brokenness into a story that one day will be beautiful, even though we only understand in part. This understanding brings us, even in grief, that kind of comfort. Because the one whose hands bends history are the ones whose hands are crucified for us, and those are the hands that hold us. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we hear your word, there are mysteries here that are deeper than us. 
Mysteries here that are higher than our minds can comprehend, wider than our imaginations can wrap ourselves around. Father, we do not pretend to understand you or your ways. And yet in humility, we thank you that tonight as we go out and we see the stars begin to appear in an evening sky and the fireflies begin to fly, that it is your hand who even in that very moment is the one not just who created, but who creates, who sustains, who upholds this world. Father, we thank you that in every action we will take this week, that in the evil that we do, we know that this is not beyond your power to redeem, and that in the good we do, we can be humble to know that it is you who works through us and in us. And Father, that as we look to the future, we look with confident hope, because you are the one who holds the future and is directing all things to your loving end, is our Holy Father. So Father, bring us your comfort tonight, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I said there are mysteries here and our hymn of response speaks of the mystery even in the midst of pain that God is in control. It is Psalter hymnal number 434. God moves in a mysterious way. We'll sing stanzas 1 through 3 and 5. Let's stand as the music begins. be seated. And the reason we can go to God in prayer is because He is strong. He is big. He is sovereign and He can change this world that is broken. And the second reason we go is because He is Father and He desires to change. And so with that double understanding of providence, are there any prayer requests tonight? Things to praise God for that He is doing in our lives or things to petition Him for to change in a broken world? Any prayer requests tonight? Yeah. Yeah. So we prayed for them this morning. We want to continue. Uh, Pastor Vasi and Miranda are on their way over. When will they get here? Five thirty tomorrow afternoon. So we want to pray for a safe travel, especially with two little ones, and uh, it's a long way to travel. And so we'll be praying for them. Thank you, Ron. Anything else? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if one of the privileges of living in Iowa is you get calls from politicians. Anyone else? I get them all the time. They're they're wanting to meet me. So, um, but that's a big decision facing us uh, this coming year. Who's going to lead this country? And we see God is sovereign over nations. One of the ways He exercises that sovereignty is through voting. And we want to just pray that God will guide us, give us wisdom, give us His will, and that His will be done in this nation. So thank you. We'll pray for that. Anything else? If not, let's pray together to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much 
for the humility that you give us in your word. It's so often easy for us to see ourselves as being stronger or smarter or better than we are, to delude ourselves to thinking that you are the lucky one to have us in your family, that somehow we are able to manage the affairs of our world, that we are on top of all that's going on and that we are in control. And yet we know that in an instant, this fiction can be robbed from us and we can be exposed to the reality that we are tiny creatures in a vast universe, so weak in the face of tragedy and even things like disease and all the ways that this world can take the rug from under our feet. And in those moments especially, we thank you that even though we don't have the answers, we can lean on your arms knowing that they are the arms who formed this universe who sustains this universe, and who one day will make all things new. Heavenly Father, we pray as we live in this world that you would make us to be agents of renewal. Heavenly Father, that you would use us in this week, that you would enliven our minds to possibilities, that you would give us new understandings to how to be faithful in this world with all of the complex decisions we will make. And Father, as we pray that not just in our personal lives and in our families and in our jobs, but also as a nation. We thank you for the privilege you give us in this nation to elect our leaders. And we pray that as we do that, we would do so with great humility and with great discernment as we seek your will. Father, we pray that even as you are sovereign over us, that you are sovereign over those who do not know you and even those in rebellion against you. And so we pray that you would work this coming election and even the decisions of those who are currently elected in such a way that you would bend the hearts of the king like water in a water course, wherever you would desire, or that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this earth does belong to you. And so we praise you with Pastor Vasi Miranda for sustaining them through a very scary time of civil war in Ukraine, that you have kept this family safe. And now we pray for your hand to go with them as they travel in these coming hours. Especially, Lord, we pray for these two little children that you would give them peace, that you would give Vasya and Miranda strength and that you would bless their time here. Lord, may you give them the words that you would have them speak. May you also enable us as a community of faith to surround them with encouragement and with joy. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even as we pray for these things that we also can join tonight with those who are praying to you behind prison bars. Lord, as we saw today, you are the one who brings reversal, who sets the prisoner free. And that even though our physical bodies may be behind bars for crimes that we've committed, we thank you that in Christ we are free. And so we pray for the Cornerstone Prison Ministry. We pray for Pastor Rick. We ask that you will continue to give him your leading. Heavenly Father, that you would continue to bless this ministry, each man behind bars, that they would know that they are forgiven, that they would know what you are doing in their life and in their heart in this time. We just pray for your blessing on this church. Heavenly Father, we also do pray that the cries of heart that we didn't bring to lips tonight, but that are still on the tip of our tongue, those things that you know that you tonight would turn our groanings into prayer, that your spirit would intercede for us with words that groans cannot express. And so, Father, we lift to you our concerns. We also lift to you our deep gratitude for your work that is finished in Jesus Christ, that because of him we can leave the doors of this church tonight celebrating that we belong to you, body and soul, in life and in death. Father, may this deep comfort well in us, deep obedience in this week. May it also flow through us in wonderful generosity to those who need physical necessities that you've entrusted with us, who also, those who need to hear the gospel. Lord, may we be agents of renewal and reconciliation as you work through us. Sovereign God, Father and King, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight we bring our gifts and our offerings and they are for that Cornerstone Prison Ministry, a congregation behind bars that is a sister congregation with us. May God bless us as we sow uh, seed into this ministry.
this holiday weekend, we stand and we profess our faith. And today we profess our faith as summarized in the Heidelberg Catechism, speaking on this doctrine we've just heard about. And so I'm going to invite you to stand now. I'm going to read the question and invite you to join in reading the answer for two question and answers, uh, 26 and 27, page 870, 871. So the first question is, friends, what do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ his Son. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is Almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful Father. And what do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things in fact come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. Doctrine of Providence, all things come to us through his fatherly hand, and those are the hands that hold us. Our song response is Psalter hymn number 457. He's got the whole world in his hands. We'll sing stanza one together, stanza four will be just the men, stanza five just the women, and then we'll join together in stanza six. He's got the whole world in his hand. in the hands of God, receive his blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to that God and Savior be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord now and forever. Friends, go in peace to love and to serve this Lord. Amen. A closing song, yeah, a closing song is God be with you till we meet again.